every time you work out, you've got to push yourself to the limit and beyond because your life depends on it. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 172, and thanks for being here. Today, we get to hear from Coach Greg Amundsen, a practitioner of Aikido, Krav Maga, and Jiu-Jitsu, as well as a CrossFit athlete and coach and author. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts two times every week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host, as well as the founder here at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you trying us on. You can find our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and that's also the easiest place to sign up for our great newsletter. As a thank you for joining, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at Whistlekick, upcoming show guests, sometimes some original content, and even discounts on products. I want to remind everyone of all the sideline things we offer and why we do them. I've never been secretive about our business model, which is all about growing the martial arts. It's my belief that the more people participating in martial arts, the more customers we'll have here at Whistlekick. That's why we're bringing this podcast, our martial arts meme site we mentioned recently, and most recently, martial arts calendar, all for free. As our martial arts realm grows, we all benefit. Thank you for supporting that vision. Our guest today has a professional resume that reads like a modern day James Bond, CrossFit athlete law enforcement officer, DEA special agent, fitness coach, business owner. That's not even the entire list. What's more impressive is many of those things I mentioned happened at the same time, and quite a few of them are still happening. A legend in the CrossFit world, Coach Amundsen has deep roots as a martial artist. Roots, according to him, that have given him the ability to live the life he now leads. Coach Amundsen, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Jeremy, thank you, brother. It is great to be here. It's great to have you here. Great to talk to you. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time, and listeners will come to understand as we talk about the different components to you and your life and the ways that I've gotten to know of you before I got to know you a little bit, and I'm just pumped to have you here. So thanks for making the time. Thank you. It's great to be here, brother. I've been looking forward to it. Awesome. You know, we kind of get started in the same way on every episode because I think it's really important that the listeners, myself included, understand who you are and your relationship to the martial arts before we can talk about anything else. How did you get started as a martial artist? That's a great question. I look back over my childhood and my earliest childhood memories are my dad driving me to the YMCA to work out. And on the way there, we had on the radio, Dr. Wayne Dreyer and Deepak Chopra. My dad was so enthusiastic about self-mastery. And one of the paths to self-mastery he adamantly believed in was some type of martial practice. So in the early childhood days, we would be exercising together in a very specific way. He was very enthusiastic and adamant about the value of what I later learned from another mentor in my life, Coach Glassman, was functional movement. So even at a young age, rather than doing what a lot of my peers were doing, such as bicep curl and uh, deltoid, you know, the variety of exercises that are designed to get the body to look a specific way, my dad had me doing handstands and back squats. And, you know, he was just a big believer in these compound multi-joint movements. And he was a chiropractor and formal Navy officer. So he was also adamant about knowing how to use your body in the most productive, efficient way possible, maximizing our power output, maximizing our ability to generate power and produce power in a productive and in a way that could apply force either to an object or if we needed to, to another human being. Now, that being said, my dad was also a minister. (laughs) So... Mm -hmm. In terms of applying force to another human being, it was always through the lens of nonviolence, more an approach to control and to use force that was being applied against us in a way that would allow that force to flow through us, continuing 
the force in another direction. So Aikido became a natural early martial art that both my dad and I learned together. And I'll tell you what, one of the greatest values I achieved from Aikido in that time in my life with my dad was learning how to roll and tumble. Because as I pursued careers in military and law enforcement, it seemed like the rolling and being able to break my fall was serving me on probably a monthly basis, you know, that, that skill. So that was the early, the early childhood. You know, when I think back, there's even a photograph I keep on my refrigerator where I'm dressed up in my dad's naval uniform and I'm holding in one hand, I've got a rifle, a toy rifle. The other hand, I've got my dad's scuba knife. I've got on knee pads. And in one knee pad, I have a backup knife stuck in my knee pad. <laughs> so, I, you know, I was just I was just so influenced by my dad and by the 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 warrior archetype at that age. And in the pursuit of the warrior archetype, the warriors are drawn to cultivating their skill set, of which martial arts is a huge, huge importance. Yeah. You know, it's just it, as I think back. You know, as as I'm hearing these things that you're talking about, you know, and, and I'm lucky compared to probably a lot of the listeners and that I know a little bit about who you are. And of course, this warrior archetype, you know, I know that that's something that resonates really strongly for you. And we're going to hear more about that. And I, I'm going to ask a favor and hope maybe you'd be willing to share that photo with us because I can't oh, be the only one that wants to see that. That, that yeah. sounds like a pretty sweet picture. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can. However, you need me to get it to you. Absolutely. It's a yeah. classic photo. And I keep it on my refrigerator as a reminder, because there's this saying that we are who we always were. And sometimes if I feel that my path is lost, or if I feel a disconnect from the warrior archetype, I look at that photograph because it reminds me when I look at myself and I see myself in my childhood eyes I remember that's who I am. There's a part of me that is a warrior and that will always walk that path. And it takes different expressions, but there's a part of me that really wants to protect and serve and to be a source of good in the world. And I attribute that to those very early childhood days and the mentorship my dad provided. Right on. Now, of course, on this show, we talk a lot about stories. Yeah. Social artists have great stories. You know, there's a long tradition of education and lessons through stories as we go back, you know, however many generations we can go back to track that stuff. And I love to hear stories. That was the reason I founded this show. I just want an excuse to hear everybody's great stories. So why don't you take a minute, tell us your best martial arts story. Oh man, that's a great question. And brother, I'm the same way you are. I love storytelling. Let me preface my story with this. One of my mentors, when I got into the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, one of my mentors at DEA said to me once, Greg, if you tell me the truth, I will believe you. If you tell me a fact, I will listen. However, if you share with me a story, then I will remember. Isn't that awesome? And that so is, that's it's pretty poignant. The, yeah, that's the beauty of the story in the warrior culture is that what warriors do is from generation to generation, we hand down stories. And that is best done through storytelling. It's a fascinating subculture within itself to look at the art of storytelling. It's such a rich tradition, especially in the warrior culture. Some of the best stories I've heard were during my times in boot camp at officer candidate school at DEA Academy. That's when these great stories were told because that's the perfect context for these instructors, whether they be drill sergeants, TAC officers, special agent instructors. That's the best time in the best context and environment to share these stories that can only be told essentially through storytelling. You almost can't even write them. They've got to be told through the human voice. So I'll share with you the story that I shared last night. I teach warrior yoga at my studio in Santa Cruz on Tuesday and Thursday night. And God put this story on my heart last night. So I'll share the story from last night at 6 p.m. 
it's such a great story. So legend has it that many, many years ago in a small town called Kyoto, Japan, there was an old, very respected samurai who had transitioned from the warrior samurai to the samurai sage. He was in a dire predicament because the town that he lived in was very close to being overrun by a group of bandits. He knew that in reality, he would need one other samurai to help him protect the villagers, whom were all farmers. They were unable to protect themselves. He needed a very specific type of samurai, so he devised a test. The test he devised was to have one of his servants hide behind the doorway entrance of a small hut with a sword held overhand. The servant's direction was anyone that walks through the doorway without hesitation, cut them down. Then he let word be known far and wide that there would be an opportunity for a samurai to join him in the protection of his village. Three samurai arrived to participate and to have the honor of protecting this village. The rules were explained and the rules were walk into that hut. Simple as that. On the first day, a young samurai, rather than walking into the hut, this guy just charges right into the hut. And no sooner than he passes the entrance, whoosh, down comes the sword and he's killed. The next day, another samurai takes the test. Now, this samurai had been walking the path of a warrior for a longer period of time. He's more centered. He has developed greater levels of self-awareness, greater levels of self-mastery. He's deeper in his practice. He walks up to the door, and as he approaches the door, he removes his sword from his scabbard, then very tactily, mindfully, with skill, he crosses the threshold of the doorway, and as that lethal blow comes down, he's able to deflect it, and he lives. But there's still one more samurai to take the test. So the following day, one more samurai takes the test. Now, this samurai is very, very centered. There's a sense of peace and inner calmness that radiates from him. He's indeed not only mastered other people in the pursuit of his practice, more importantly, he's mastered himself. And so what he does is interesting. About 10 feet away from the doorway, he becomes still and he takes a deep breath. And then he senses that something is amiss. His intuition is so well developed. He knows something is amiss. And he yells out, you, behind the doorway, come out, show yourself, or we will both surely perish. And upon seeing this, the samurai sage that had devised the test, he says, yes, this is the samurai that will save our village. And legend has it that that samurai and the sage together protected and saved the town of Kyoto, Japan. Isn't that awesome? That's a fantastic story. Yeah. And, I and really dig that. Where I, where I lead with this story, so the theme last night, I always share a story before I begin the yoga class so that we can move into the physical practice through the lens of the story. So the question now to contemplate for your listeners is, where are we in our practice? Which of those three samurai are we in this moment in our life? Are we that samurai that is charging full speed ahead or are we a little bit more developed in our path or are we like that true warrior that's master not only the outer realm but the inner realm and that's really what we're all desirous of this is why the text the art of war is so fascinating because the author is trying to inspire this new generation of young warrior to realize that to win a thousand battles 
in battle is not the mark of a great warrior. It's to win a battle without ever having to go into battle in the first place. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I, I tell my non-martial arts friends that I'm most proud of is not the fights that I've won, but those situations where it very easily could go sideways, it could turn to blows, and then I find a way to defuse it. Yeah. You know, as a, as a 16 year veteran of law enforcement, that was always my goal. And it was inspired through these classic texts on martial arts, mainly Art of War and Book of Five Rings. I was so fascinated by this idea that these great samurai were using strategy, terrain, the direction of the sun. How amazing! So they were using their environment to benefit their martial practice. And I use those same strategies in law enforcement. And I was able to apprehend people on a regular basis whom were considered to be two or three deputy calls, meaning that normally that person would require two or three deputies to apprehend and effect an arrest. I was able to apprehend them without even using force because I was able to use strategy and timing and leverage and trickery and deceit <laughs> to to woe them into handcuffs. And when people ask me, how are you doing that? I said, you've got to read these books because strategy, both mastering our mind and our inner world is just as important as trying to master the physical art that we're all practicing, which at that time for law enforcement was known as defensive tactics. And I was trying to explain that Defensive tactics, if you have self-doubt, is not going to help you. Yet if you're able to achieve this vibration, this energy of inner certainty, that is transferred at the level of the soul of the spirit to another human being. And people tend to just succumb without ever having to come to force. Hmm. Totally. You know, it's interesting that on this show, the the books that come up most often, I mean, we've got a couple modern ones, but Book of Five Rings, Art of War, these are not new books by any stretch of the imagination, and yet they're still so relevant. People haven't changed as much, I think, as we like to pretend. We like to think that we're so evolved, and yeah, we have modern conveniences, but who we are as people, not that different than we were a thousand years ago. Oh, well said, brother. Yeah, human nature is human nature. It always was and always will be. We evolve in the sense that I think we begin to gain greater and greater levels of understanding. And wow, speaking of understanding, I spent a three-day course with a gentleman named Dan Brule, a modern-day warrior, modern-day warrior yogi. Dan Brule has a new book coming out that I highly recommend called Just Breathe. He's a breathing master. And if you look at every warrior tradition, every warrior tradition is adamant about the benefit of mastering the breath. And how do you know you've mastered the breath? Well, that's still, for me, a question I'm trying to answer daily. However, I'll tell you how I know that Dan's mastered the breath, because whenever I'm within a few feet of Dan, here's what I do. I go like this. <sighs> I, I take the deepest breath of my life. You know, that guy has that resounding effect. The only other person that's been able to have that effect on my breath is Mark Devine, another student of Dan Brule who teaches breath work. So Dan said something fascinating to me on Saturday at this breath mastery course. It was in Ojai, California. And what he said, I'm still trying to unravel. It was that deep and profound. I was talking to Dan about how I'm trying to understand the challenges that I've had in my life. And I'm trying to understand the karma that I'm experiencing. And what Dan said was, Greg, you know what? Understanding is overrated. Because even in a moment of understanding something, we're only understanding it 
from our current level of understanding, which is limited. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So my understanding of something today, in a year from now, I will gain greater understanding. And a year from that, I'll gain greater understanding. And in that conversation, I said, Dan, you just helped bring a Bible verse alive to me with new meaning. Because the Bible says, lean not on your own understanding, but trust in every word of God. And so I've been spending more time leaning on my own understanding and trying to understand the nature of cause and effect. That's well beyond me. But the good news is, as a Christian, I don't need to worry about trying to understand things because I can turn to the word of God and faith in God. And that very quickly alleviates me of trying to control the world, <laughs> which no matter you know how many years I do CrossFit or how many years I practice martial arts, it's just not going to happen. Right. Without right. <laughs> a doubt. Between the stories that you've been telling, you know, really the answers to my first two questions. We've got a really good context. I think people can tell by now you're a pretty positive person. You're, you're an upbeat person. You're striving for personal growth. And in any way, you can achieve it. I mean, you almost seem hungry for it. Let's talk about some of the, the things that we haven't. What else outside of martial arts, personal growth, what gets you going? What are your hobbies, your, your interests? Hmm. Wow, it's a great question, brother, because everything that I do, all my passions are, all my passions allow me to know God on a deeper level. So knowing God, that intimacy, that passion I have to know God in my life, that's the catalyst for everything that I do. I sincerely believe that at birth, we're all given a specific mission in life. Each one of us has talents and skills and abilities, and these talents, skills, and abilities are not for our benefit. They're for the benefit of those people whom we serve. And the greater we get to know God in our life, the greater we're able to allow these passions and skills and abilities to come to fruition. And when we co-create with God, the gift that God's bestowed upon us, we're ultimately able to share, which creates a reciprocal flow. So as I give, as I create, as I love, as I share, that love, that sharing, that gifting returns to me in a beautiful, continual flow of energy. So that being said, what do I love and enjoy to do? Well, there's there's never a shortage. I mean, I <laughs> I, I I you know, at the end of the day, sometimes I I wish I had more hours. And in the morning I I, you know, I jump out of bed eager to to continue on the path because there's so much to do, but there's a difference between having so much to do and being busy. Being busy means we're at the mercy of other people and being busy means that we're reactive and being reactive is not the path of a warrior. Being reactive, if we go back to the first story, the first samurai that ran into the house was reactive and he was cut down. The very last samurai, he had an abundance of time. He had so much time that he could stand still. And in that standing still, he was able to create the perfect resolution and outcome to that moment. He didn't even have to do anything. He just stood still and took a breath. And in that breath, he created the perfect outcome. And so what I found is that sometimes I'm able to achieve more by doing less. Yet what I'm achieving, what I'm creating, what I'm cultivating in the world, sometimes I'll even step back and pause and I scratch my head because 
I don't know how it happened other than by the grace of God. <laughs> you know, last last year I published two books. I, I have no recollection of even writing them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, 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 I vaguely remember sitting down for long periods of time. But other than that, the grace of God just flowed through me. But I created that space because I've come to learn that God's desirous of moving through all of us. Yet in order to allow that flow of life force to come through, we've got to trust and be able to become still. Yeah. Well said. I'd like you to tell us about a point in your life where things weren't going so well. I mean, you're a pretty upbeat guy. You're a positive guy. And I've got a feeling that you've been blessed for a long time with a lot of good things that have happened. But no one has that perpetually. We all go through rocky points. Think about one of those. Tell us about it. And tell us how your martial arts training helped you through it. Yeah, solid question. Let me let me preface that question <laughs> with a story. <laughs> okay. You know I'm never going to turn down a story. Yeah. <laughs> this is such a great story because... Well, let me share the story. Then I'll explain why I'm passionate about this story and why I think it's important to answer the question you've asked me through the lens of the warrior archetype. So one of the most famous battles to ever take place took place at the gates of Thermopylae. 300 Spartan warriors were preparing to defend Everything they knew, their culture, their family, their tradition, they were prepared to defend to the death against overwhelming odds, a Persian army of millions. The night before the battle, a scout went out to conduct a reconnaissance of the enemy force. And the next morning, this scout comes back at a dead sprint. He approaches the king and says, King Leonidas, we must retreat. We are so outnumbered. The enemy force so outnumbers us that the archer element alone, just the archers, not the cavalry, not the infantry, just the archers, when they loose their arrows, their arrows will block out the sun. To this, King Leonidas says the following, good, then we will fight our battle in the shade. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Think about the discipline the king had in that moment. In that moment, when the average person would be so fearful so overcome by the gravity of the situation, the arrows will block out the sun? Oh my goodness, quickly, let's retreat. Yet this king was so disciplined, they mastered themselves. They mastered their self-talk. They literally mastered their thinking. And as a result of mastering their thinking, they were able to also master their speaking. And therefore, the king spoke with positive expectancy. And he said, good, then we'll fight our battle in the shade. So he was able to see an opportunity for success, even in the midst of overwhelming defeat. And that is the goal of the modern day warrior. The modern day warrior, as we advance in our practice, is able to see that little sliver of opportunity in everything. No matter how overwhelming the odds, no matter how challenging the set of circumstances before us, we've disciplined our mind to see the most minute opportunity for success for victory. And then we focus on that small detail 
we put all our force on that small detail and we're able to overcome even the greatest of challenges or opponents. This is essentially what happened at the battle between two people, David and Goliath. How easy would it have been to be overcome by the gravity of the situation? This small farmer, this small boy, this shepherd is going to fight the most fearful warrior of all time, Goliath, a giant. He was even offered armor and he said no. He trusted in himself in the smallest detail of his craft, the sling and a small rock. And he was very accurate in the placement of that rock and it brought down Goliath. And that's the perfect example. That's what King Leonidas did. So I use this story and I always hold this story in my heart because just like any other person, Jeremy, that you and I stopped on the street and said, what are some of the challenges you faced? Every one of us can default. Our mind has a default to those challenges. And as we default to the challenge, we have a golden opportunity to see a challenge in our life through the lens of defeat or the lens of victory. And this is, again, why I turn to the Bible in these moments, because in the Bible, it says, my God supplies all I need according to his riches in the glory of Christ Jesus. It doesn't say my God supplies all I need so that I would be defeated and fall to my knees in discouragement. <laughs> it's saying that everything that we experience in our life, although in the moment, like Dan Brule says, we're trying to understand it. Well, rather than trying to understand it, let's see it as an opportunity. Iron can sharpen iron. And these circumstances that the average person might think are out to get us, if we view them as an opportunity to temper and strengthen and sharpen our blade, well, then we can propel ourselves into higher and higher levels of self-mastery and growth. It's simply an opportunity to shift our awareness and our perspective of the world. Yeah. Wow. I dig it. <laughs> and so, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Another, another way, like, because that, you know, that, that might leave a listener scratching their head. So here, here's the real life application of that in my life. In 2011, if I recall, 2011, I was, I was hit by a series of challenges that all cascaded through my life in just a matter of months. We say that some of the biggest challenges that someone can go through, in particular a man, because it threatens our male ego and identity, are change of career, loss of a family member, moving, dealing with attorneys, and divorce. I would add to that loss of a pet. I experienced those six challenges within two months of each other. And in that moment, I vividly recall my self-talk, and I vividly recall realizing this is a moment to utilize the practice. This is the whole point of having a martial practice for these very moments. So I use those challenges in my life to benefit others. And rather than dwelling on the mistakes that I made, I wrote a book on those mistakes. But more importantly than identifying the mistakes, I identified what I could do differently in the future. And that book, it's called Your Wife is Not Your Sister and 15 Other Love Lessons I Learned the Hard Way. That book has sold thousands and thousands of copies, and it's therefore saved thousands and thousands of marriages and intimate relationships from collapse. That book is required reading in several law enforcement academies because in the law enforcement environment, sadly, divorce is at a disproportionately high rate. And this book has helped 
that specific culture in addition to the military environment. So there I was at a crossroads in my life. I used the martial practice to strengthen myself. As the martial artist strengthens ourself, we concurrently strengthen all those who are committed to walking the path of the warrior with us. And that's exactly what the book has done. And what's so amazing is that that ability to use the challenge in our life, if we look at some of the great leaders and teachers in our current warrior culture, they've done the same thing. And it's a real gift to give the world because as one person is able to learn from a challenge and a setback in their life, they help another warrior on the path avoid that same pitfall. So talk about transcending our karma. That's the ultimate way to do it is to help a future warrior, to help a future generation. The thing I'm struck by, and I think a lot of people listening may, may gloss over this, this detail. You know, you rattled off a list of some pretty rough stuff. You told us that you experienced all six of these things in a two month time, but there was no negativity in your voice. There was no self deprecating words, but what you talked about, what came out of it was something that you're very proud of, that you took that challenge, you met it, you grew from it and you found a way to help others out of it. And that's something that I think a lot of us strive to do, whether or not we realize it consciously. And I think it's a great example for people to look at and say, Hey, you know, here, here's coach Amundsen sharing this knowledge, taking what he experienced and flipping it around and hopefully someone else doesn't have to endure the same pain. Because I'm sure that two-month period of time was incredibly painful. You're, you're probably, you know, you're, you're not digging into that, but I can imagine that your cheerful demeanor may have been diminished a bit during those, those days. <laughs> it was fuel for the fire within. I used it as an opportunity to deepen my practice, to really commit to the practice. And as you were speaking, something struck me. You know, in my travels, I, I travel all around the country teaching the principles of CrossFit and goal setting and leadership to law enforcement. One of the most common mantras in the law enforcement community is protect and serve. So if you see law enforcement patrol vehicles, most departments have a motto or mantra painted or decaled onto their patrol vehicles. And the majority of departments have protect and serve. And so if someone is desirous of developing the warrior archetype, what better mantra to adhere to than protect and serve? And so each and every one of us has that desire within our heart, once we even scratch the surface of the warrior archetype, we're compelled to protect and serve others. And those opportunities that the martial artist dreams of, of being able to defuse a hostage situation, you know, that's what we dream of. Well, those opportunities <laughs> are few and far between. But we all have an opportunity to protect others from the, the heartbreak and from the setback and from the challenges that we've experienced in our life. That's a more realistic use of the warrior path is to witness the mistakes and the challenges that we've had and then help others through the lessons of our life and so that they can avoid, we can protect them, we can help serve them. <laughs> Undoubtedly. And, and I think it's a great lesson. And I think it's something that I know I'm working on it in my life. And it's something I hope that the listeners will continue to work on because I know most of you out there are doing so, whether you realize it or not. <laughs> Let's talk about competition. It's something that hasn't come up as we've talked about you and your path, but you know, you're a CrossFitter and I know CrossFitters almost unilaterally 
come from a, a stock of competitive folks. Let's let's talk about your competitive mindset and how that surfaces in martial arts for you. Competition is such an interesting idea. It's an idea. Um, you know, we we have this idea that we are drawn to competition. It's an idea. It's a paradigm. And if we're competing, the likely use and context is that, well, we're competing against another person. And what I've learned through CrossFit and through martial arts is that that is exactly what the author Sun Tzu in Art of War was warning people against. It's not about competing against other people. If we're desirous of competing against others and basing our self-worth against other people, that is the warning in the book. Power is not displayed through overcoming other people. Power is displayed by overcoming ourselves. So, uh, of course, <laughs> let, let's let's transition into a story because there's this amazing story that I heard years ago, and it's helped to mitigate the temptation of the ego in me, which is in everyone, to compete against others. And this is a story about Alexander the Great. He was leading his army through India, and suddenly this massive army that had literally overcome the world, came to a dead halt because the lead platoon element had come across three yogis who are seated on the path in meditation, blocking the continuation of the formation. A young lieutenant comes up and demands that these yogis clear the roadway, and they don't budge. They continue to sit in meditation. Well, along comes a captain and says to the lieutenant, Lieutenant, what seems to be the problem? There's three yogis seated. Move them out of the way. Well, along comes a major and says, Captain, Lieutenant, what's the holdup? It's just these three yogis. And then finally, along comes the great king. And the king looks at these three yogis, and now there's some pressure on the lieutenant, on the captain, and on the major. And the lieutenant yells at the yogis and says, look, do you know who this is? This is Alexander the Great. He has overcome the world. Who are you to stand in his way? And with this, the elder of the yogis looks up and says, I do not need to overcome the world because I have overcome myself. And with this, King Alexander turns to his leadership and then the entire army. And he says, if I could be anyone other than the man that I am, I would be this yogi. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? That's fantastic. The, the the yogi had overcome himself and as we turn the attention inward this is the practice that's known in ashtanga yoga warrior yoga as pratyahara or turning the attention inward where the normal lure of the senses is drawn out into the world. So we project our self-worth onto material objects or onto the identification of the ego on status. And normally competition is derived from a desire for status. And that's all an illusion of the ego. And here's the challenge, the real insight for the warrior for the martial artist. And if there's ever a culture that could understand this lesson, it is the martial artist. Because what we need to be wary of is trying to control 
our circumstances, trying to control the external environment or trying to control an opponent. What we need to do is develop control of ourselves. That's really the path that we're on is trying to self-master, trying to master ourselves. So the desire for competition, if we view competition through the practice of pratyahara, who are we really competing against in any given moment? Ourselves. So as long as we're competing against ourselves, as long as we're practicing what they refer to in the samurai tradition as kaizen, kaizen, K-A-I-Z-E-N, meaning trying to be a little bit better than our self of yesterday. If that's where we're directing the energy of competition, well, fantastic. But if we're constantly trying to compete against other people, that's ultimately a path that leads to suffering. No good can come from that. Agree. Hmm. If you could train with any martial artist from any point in time, who would that be? Oh, man. Your questions are awesome, brother. Thanks. You know, I I, I got to say, um, oh, you know, this is this is such a lofty way to answer the question, but how how incredible would it have been to have been an apostle of Jesus Christ? <laughs> You know, um, uh, imagine being there with a fishing net in your hand and along comes Christ and says, follow me. And just to have the courage to drop everything and follow. Um, now, I answering the question that way means that I view Jesus Christ as one who walked the path of a warrior. And I do. With all my heart, I think that Christ led the path of the epitome of the warrior. What better expression of all we're desirous of achieving? Talk about self-mastery. <laughs> oh, gosh, what a, what a example to follow. Um, and that being said, in... In my life at this very moment, I'm blessed with an incredible mentor. One of the greatest martial artists I think living today is Mark Devine. And I'm blessed in that I see and correspond with Mark on a regular basis. He's, he's been a, a dear mentor of mine on the warrior path since we met in Boulder, Colorado, at a law enforcement CrossFit seminar years and years ago. So part of me wishes I could go back in time and be an apostle of Christ. And part of me is very grateful to be right here right now with the great mentorship that Mark is providing me. And Mr. Devine is certainly somebody that I want on the show and and maybe maybe I can poke you for an introduction because I have reached out and I oh, have a busy he, he man. Such an awesome yeah guest. yeah he's oh, yeah he's a, he's a pretty cool guy yeah he's he's done, just... he's done a lot so all right you've named some books I mean we talked about the art of war we talked about book of five rings you mentioned one of the books that you've written but I know you've written more than one so just real quick and, and we're gonna we're gonna do our commercial time a little bit later on but. Let's just kind of close the book loop, and then we're going to talk about movies and actors. So what are the other books that you've written? I've written two from 2016. One of them is called God in Me, Daily Devotionals for a Heart Like Christ. That book was, oh, wow. What a, what a experience to write that book because my relationship with God became so profoundly deep. You know, the way that book was written was communion with God. I would pray, I would meditate, and then I would just open my mind and my heart to the presence of God. And as quick as my fingers could move, I would pour onto the pages his word, his message. 
So that was an incredible book to write. And then the other book from last year, this actually came out uh, January 5th, 2017, but it was written during 2016, is the culmination of 16 years of walking the warrior path. In many respects, I started writing that book in December 2001. December 2001, within a week of each other, I found and started my practice in CrossFit, and I found and started a practice that continues to this day in Krav Maga. And this book is a culmination of the great lessons and the great mentors, the great leaders, the great experiences that I've had. And the book is called Fire Breather Fitness. And it's broken down into three categories, mind, body, and spirit. And what's so amazing when I reflect on the book is that each one of those parts of the book could essentially stand on its own. And more often than not, we compartmentalize our training. So if a student is lucky, they they find a mentor to help them develop their spirituality, their body, and their mind. Yet, unless those three instructors are talking, then the training is compartmentalized. And the real power in the practice is our ability to integrate the mind, the body, and the spirit together. And I was blessed with mentors that had developed that very ability. And I share what they taught me in the book. So Fire Breather Fitness, wow, I I love this book. Uh, because the book highlights some of these great teachers who God was so graceful and and merciful with in my life to allow me to learn from. Mm. For sure. And we're going to have links to the the books, of course, in the show notes, whistlekickmarshwartsradio.com to anybody that might be new. Let's talk about movies. We've talked about books. We've talked a lot about your views on the warrior archetype. I've got a feeling you might have some Interesting answers to these questions. Tell us about your favorite movies and martial arts, martial arts movies and martial arts actors. Mm. Great question. I was always fascinated. I just loved the James Bond movies. James Bond was, he was a character in my life that I was, I was drawn to, you know, I, 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 even when I started the application process for the DEA, you know, a a part of me was like, Ooh, this is my chance to really be like James Bond, <laughs> the, <laughs> the secret agent. Um, and, and what was so awesome about James Bond is he, he was that fine line. Like his character was that character that was walking between the world of, reality and fiction you know even the fight scenes were like wow that's realistic i could i could do that (laughs) you know crouching tiger hidden dragon for example i love it like fantastic movie you know that's like oh we all dream of mastering our ability to fly and soar through the air but okay you know (laughs) maybe not not yet um But a movie like James Bond, we see those fight scenes and we're like, yeah, I can develop that skill and ability. (laughs) So, you know, I think I think the James Bond movies, maybe maybe it's not the true martial arts movie, but there was something about that character that I was just so drawn to even to this day. So, so drawn to Bond. My guess, you know, and if I, I may psychoanalyze you for a brief moment. You really seem drawn to the service above self lifestyle, martial arts, law enforcement, higher elements of law enforcement, faith, James Bond. It seems like a continuation of that from my perspective, because what do we know? I'm assuming everybody out there has seen at least one James Bond movie. He's willing to die at any moment for the cause. And there's, there's something really powerful in that surrender towards whatever the mission is that's my guess absolutely absolutely you know wow speaking of willing to die in a moment for the cause there's this great story of a judo practitioner 
he's being interviewed because he's on this victory streak. He's undefeated. No one can defeat him. And he's being interviewed. And the interviewer asks if there's any rituals that he's developed in his life. And he briefly explains, well, before every match, I make a point to take a bath. And so that if I die in the match, my body would be well scented. And then he goes on to answer several other questions. And I remember reading that interview and I glance over that statement. Then I come back to it and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> this guy takes a bath because in the event he should die in a judo competition, his body would be well scented. Now, I'm not sure if anyone's ever died in a judo competition, but this guy was ready to die. He was ready to lay it down. And no wonder he was undefeated. His opponents were not nearly as committed. And I always remembered that. And, you know, when I, when I work out to this day, and I'll, I'll preface this statement because it, 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 it's hard to understand if we take it out of context. But a few days before I found CrossFit, I nearly lost my life on the street as a deputy sheriff to have a fight for your life is something that changes you especially in the context of law enforcement because i'd heard stories in the police academy of law enforcement officers that had died and after being killed the suspect took their firearm and then killed other law enforcement officers with their firearm. And as I was fighting for my life that day, that thought occurred to me that if I die, this guy's going to take my gun and he's going to kill the next deputy that arrives on scene. And that scared me more than losing my own life. The fact that harm could come to another deputy. Mm. Man, it kind of chokes me up, man. And yeah. after that happened, yeah, it's like it kind of brings me to tears. After that happened, I started, uh, I, I, was, I was a man on a mission, Jeremy, because I knew that there was something I needed to do differently in my training and so that that wouldn't happen to me again and thank god that i met coach glassman because in my first workout i felt like i was gonna die <laughs> you know i i knew i wasn't but that moment as i was racing against a gentleman named mike weaver i felt that if i rode even one meter faster, if I did one more kettlebell swing at a faster tempo, I might die. And my mindset that day in my first workout was, I've got to win. I've got to do my very best. Because if this is the last workout before the fight for my life, then the default memory I need to have is that I gave it my best. Because if I only go 80% in this workout, then on the street, I'll have pre-programmed myself to go 80%, which is going to result in loss of life. So every workout since December 2001 to this day, my mindset is that I've got to train like my life depends on it because it does. And that's the message when I teach the law enforcement officers is that every time you work out, you've got to push yourself to the limit and beyond 
because your life depends on it. I think regardless of why we train, I think that that's a pretty important lesson, an important perspective that people can have. Very few of us are ever going to be in a life and death situation. And that's, we're lucky for that. And we're lucky for that because of law enforcement officers like, like you, people that are willing to step up and put their lives on the line so that we can live in a mostly safe society. And, and I certainly appreciate that. But it allows us as martial artists to give a different perspective to our training. Just because it's personal development, just because most of us will never be in a life and death situation, doesn't mean that trying to put yourself in that, I want to, I don't want to say that physical situation. I'm not proposing that you go out to a bar and find a really large drunk guy and pick a fight with him. <laughs> but what I am saying is that that experience, that physiological response can be cultivated, whether it's in CrossFit or, you know, 10 minutes of intense sparring or, you know, any other number of things, most of us have at least dabbled in it. And I think that there's something really valuable in the lessons you learn about yourself in those moments. Yeah. You know, the founder of traditional Okinawan karate, Guchin Funzaski, he had these great quotes that I think for the modern day martial artist, the modern day warrior are so important to hold in our heart. And one of his, it just, it's brilliant in, in what he said. He said that when I leave my house, I face 1000 opponents. Isn't that awesome. Yeah. And he said that when he practices kata, he always holds life and death in mind. His opponent is always on his mind. And so the difference between someone who dabbles in martial arts and dabbles in CrossFit and dabbles in yoga and dabbles in meditation and self-mastery and someone committed to the warrior path is that once we make that commitment, the quality of our intention that we bring to our practice is different because the quality that we're bringing is life and death. We take our training deadly serious because we're committed to life. We're committed to life. So we take our training deadly serious because we love our life. We love our fellow humans that we are sharing this life with. We're committed to protecting and serving the ones whom we love in our life. And that love that we have for ourselves and other people compels us to take our training deadly serious. Wow. Powerful stuff. We've heard a lot of intense stories from you today. A lot of amazing insights. And, you know, we have episodes once in a while that really make me think and listeners might be able to tell I'm a little less prone to jumping in during our conversation than I am for some of the interviews because you've got me thinking. I mean, my head's reeling a little bit at some of these insights that you're sharing into your life and just the way you perceive the world. So I appreciate that. I thank you for coming on and being so candid. Let's thank switch. No, the, the honor is mine without a doubt, but let's switch gears for a second. I promise you some commercial time. We've heard a bit about your books and I've got a feeling that there are quite a few listeners out there that are listening to this interview saying, I want more. I want more of, of you, of coach Amundsen. So talk to us about the books. Talk to us about the other things that you've got going on. Tell us how people can reach out to you, follow you on social media and all that good stuff. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. I think well, they've already heard about the books. That's a great way, especially God in Me and Fire Breather Fitness. God in Me is meant to be read one page a day, and each reading corresponds with the day. That book has really 
led people to a deeper understanding of God's word, a modern understanding. Because what I do in the book is I weave the word of God through storytelling. The warrior archetype is weaved into the traditional messages that we learn in the Bible. Fire Breather Fitness, wow, that's an opportunity to learn in a book from some of the greatest mentors and teachers alive today. My social media would be gregoryamundsen.com. That's my website. My CrossFit website is crossfitamundsen.com. And then the book, Fire Breather Fitness, also has a website, firebreatherfitness.org. And what I'm really pumped about is I'm going to be starting a show called The Greg Amundsen Show. It's set to air in April. And that will be a dual show. Some of the episodes will air on YouTube for viewers that want a more interactive experience. Yet every show that airs on YouTube, the audio will be on a podcast. And the whole first season will be dedicated to understanding the power of our mind. And I'm really excited because the power of the mind is one of those subjects that has always fascinated me. And some of the mentors in my life that normally we think are teaching physical adaptation, such as Coach Glassman, the founder of CrossFit, really what he taught me was the mental adaptation to a physical training program. So the whole first season is going to be dedicated to really cultivating the mindset of a warrior, really harnessing the power of our mind. That sounds like great stuff. And of course, once it is live, please let us know. We'll update the show notes. Let's look at martialartsradio.com. So people, if you're listening, if you're listening later, you know, after this, you know, sometime April 2017, Mark, that show is probably going to be live. So hit the website and we'll, we'll give you all the links for it so you can check it out yourself. Awesome. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Let's go out. We go out the same way, just as we come in the same way for every guest, but that doesn't mean it's the same. It's always a little bit different and I've got a feeling this is going to be some good stuff. So what advice would you give to the people listening right now? Mm. Great question. Parting advice. Let me share the advice that my parents gave me. My mom and dad have both passed away. And my mom and dad were in their own respect, in their own right. They were warriors. They were committed to serving others. And the parting advice they gave me was life changing. You know, it, if we can change the direction of our life by one degree, even a one degree change in the direction and the trajectory of our life over time can have the most resounding impact. Take, for example, an airplane that departs from John F. Kennedy in New York. The plane is bound for San Diego. Yet they're one degree off their flight plan. That plane lands in San Francisco. San Diego and San Francisco are eight hours away from each other. So over time, over time, the one degree change that we think is insignificant on any given day, well, over time that compounds. And a one degree change over time, we're not the same person. <laughs> and here's that one degree change that first my dad offered me and then my mom. So in 2001, my dad was nearing the end of his life. He was battling terminal cancer. And my mom called me. I was in Santa Cruz at the time. And my dad was at the hospital in Stockton, Dameron Hospital. My mom called me and said, you've, you've got to come up here as soon as you can. 
your dad probably isn't going to make it through the night. So I dropped everything I was doing and I drove from Santa Cruz to Stockton, went right to the hospital, up to the third floor. And when I got there, my mom left the room so that I could have some time with my dad. And at this time in my life, I was starting on the path of law enforcement. I was a new officer, a recruit officer for Scotts Valley Police Department. That's where I started my law enforcement career. And like many young law enforcement officers, pride was a motivating factor in my life. A lot of things that I did were for pride. And I really wanted my dad to be proud of me. And so his eyes were closed. He was there on the hospital bed. And I I leaned over him and I kind of whispered in his ear, dad, I am going to make you proud of me. And a smile crept up on his face. He opened his eyes and looked at me and and through a, a very strained voice, he said, Greg, whatever you do, do it for love. And that was the last, well, you know, those were the last words that my, my dad spoke to me, whatever you do, do it for love. And that was the one degree change in my life. That day I recommitted to doing everything for love, not pride. Pride is a factor of the ego where love is a factor of the heart. And when we do things for love, the power that we're able to channel through our life, through our work, through our ministry, through our practice is the very love of God. It's, it's, it's incredible. And then my mom, my mom, once my brothers and I were all out of the house, we'd all started our careers and my, my mom went back for her second tour into the Peace Corps, yet she wanted to serve in one of the most Oh, gosh. I mean, she was in a place called Umar Ras, Jordan. It it was a very harsh environment. When my mom spoke to me about where she wanted to serve, I'm like, Mom, you know, of course, I understand your desire to serve in the Peace Corps to go back on another tour. But are you sure you want to go there? She said, that's where I feel called, Greg. (laughs) And so I said, "Okay." And what's funny is, I happened to have a contact, a diplomatic security agent at the embassy in Jordan was a friend of mine. And we we spoke and I said, look, bro, my mom's coming out. She's going to be in this remote part of Jordan. Can you just kind of keep an eye on her? And he said, absolutely. You know, she'll she'll be good to go, brother. Um, But, you know, she lived in a in a hut and all of her possessions for the the about 18 months that she was there, they fit in a backpack. You know, it's like, wow, mom, you're, you're, you're a warrior. And she was ministering and teaching uh, self-worth and self-love to, to this, this small village and these, these female, these young females that live there. She was trying to inspire them. And she had a massive stroke while she was there. There was a undiagnosed brain tumor, massive stroke, she was medevaced out and a military plane brought her back to Davis, the UC Davis Medical Center. And I was actually on a training deployment with the army at the time. And I received word and dropped everything, drove across the country to be with her. And when I got to her, she had been in and out of consciousness. And when I when I was at her bedside, she came to, she, she came to consciousness Yet it was it was apparent that part of her was here and part of her was likely already with God, you know, and with my dad. And here's what she said. She said, Greg, everyone can support someone and be supported at the same time. And she explained that we we can all be a source of encouragement for someone else. And essentially what she said, you know, through her understanding of the path of the warrior, essentially what she said is that we can all in some degree protect and serve. Everyone can encourage somebody 
and be supported at the same time. Everyone can protect somebody. Everyone can serve somebody. And that that was a one degree change also. You know, that that moment is just crystallized in my mind. And so, you know, rather than trying to to give um, my advice to the listener, which, which which is my advice in this moment through my own understanding, which you know Dan Brule has inspired me to realize is is limited, and always will be. I can I can pass on the advice of of my parents, you know, people that were were so close to God and that that had walked the path of a warrior so so many years, and whose advice has had resounding positive impact on my life and if their advice and their counsel which has been of service to me can be of service to you jeremy and to the listeners on your show then i'll feel that the legacy my parents have left me is continued on and on and on what an amazing storyteller coach Amundsen took to our format and just ran with it i really enjoyed the way he wove together tales from his childhood recent past, and even some of the legendary tales from fiction. I feel privileged to speak with someone I've admired for, honestly, a long time. Thank you, Coach Amundsen, for coming on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with that awesome photo he mentioned from his childhood, as well as plenty of links and some other good stuff. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Our username is Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. If you like the show, you know you should be subscribing. Hopefully you're all doing that. And if you want to help us out beyond that, we'd appreciate it. But of course, it's not a requirement. We're just asking sometimes that maybe you give something back. Best way, share the show with some friends. You could also leave us reviews, join the newsletter list, join that Facebook group, like us on Facebook, or make a purchase. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day and spending it here with me. Until next episode, train hard, smile, and have a great day.